Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Norman Christopher, and I just arrived here with gusty, blowing winds outside. The question is, we all see gusty, blowing winds. What direction are they coming from, and how strong are they? This discussion today is about the role of the social entrepreneur. Think of it this way. Think about the East meeting the West, thinking about business on one hand now in its world, meeting the NGO in its world in this common space of how do we improve the quality of life. Well, when you look at these gusty blowing winds, there are lots of them out there. Most of us live at that billion dollar top of the pyramid, but there's seven billion plus people in the world. When you see our issues at the top of the pyramid, we're blessed, we have lots of resources, but yet we operate in a crisis mode. <laughs> All you do is just listen to what's out there. There are economic crisis, healthcare crisis, energy crisis, but there are four billion plus people that live at the base of the pyramid. They have a different blowing wind. It's around basic needs, literacy, food, sanitation, health. And I'd like to venture forth a thought with you all this afternoon that we're starting to see some of those basic need issues arrive in our inner cities. As you look at this today, what you find is that the neighborhood issues, and there are many of them, and you could see them up there. You look at school dropouts, we have way too many of them in our inner city today. You have issues of elevated crime levels, concerns about unemployment, that reaches all sectors today, but more importantly, unemployment then leads to issues of poverty. You have blighted neighborhoods. You just drive through today and you see things boarded up, homes and buildings. And now you see transient families where before they must, might have been in there in an occupied house, now they may be just renting or moving from place to place. And then the issue of poor use of healthcare services. One interesting statistic is, you've, you, at least in Grand Rapids, if you go and look at the hospitals of today, you'll find that the emergency rooms are being used many times for non-threatening types of incidents. So the question when you look up there is, whose responsibility is it to solve some of those collective issues? Is it business? Is it NGO? Is it government? Is it the academic sector? Now arrives on the scene the social entrepreneur. As you can see, the social entrepreneur is young, very vibrant. First of all, they're a problem solver. They look to get at these quality of life issues. They're also a change agent. They understand the models that have been used before have probably been tweaked, and they need to know and look at a new transformational change model. They're very resilient. They stay very positive even in the tough times. They walk the walk regardless of the situation. They're very persistent. They don't take no for an easy answer. They're very passionate. They work from issues of the heart, not necessarily our analytical mind. They're extremely visionary, and when you look at that, these problems that we're going to discuss here very shortly are very long-term but they're very resourceful and they've got access to new capital that maybe some of us can learn from. And more importantly, they want to make an impact now. One of the things about sustainability, and probably many of you have heard, it's based on a triple bottom line. A triple bottom line looks like a three-legged stool. It has an environmental, it has an economic, and it has social. When I went to get my MBA, I was only maybe experienced to look at three, financial or asset capital, manufactured capital, economic capital, and in human resources. So those are the only three. Well, today in sustainability, we look, number one, at the environment. That offers up enormous amounts of natural resources, trillions of dollars of resources that can be tapped into through geothermal, wind, air, water, and the list goes on. But look at the number of resources that are beginning to pop up in that social impact area. Knowledge capital, advocacy capital, shared capital. And I offer the fact that the social entrepreneur is learning how to get into those shared resources through 
universities, cities, communities, businesses, and tapping into the public, private, academic, and service sectors. But where are we really headed? And I've been in this space now for nine years, coming out of business. And one of the things I've learned every time my sustainability continues, and I don't think I'll ever finish it, <laughs> is this area of place. We're here today in a place. We have six partnerships in West Michigan that flourish around community sustainability. Why do we have six? We have one in Grand Rapids, one here in Muskegon, Holland, Zealand, Grand um, Haven in Spring Lake, Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, and Portage. Why do we have six? And I offer its place. And it's a type of capital, cultural capital, community capital that we have not yet really understood how to tap into. And I go back to one personal experience. I went to New Zealand a couple years ago and I was experienced to meet and the pleasure to meet the Maori, who are the indigenous people of New Zealand. And we spent a day with them, just like our Native Americans. And one of the first questions that was posed was, give me a definition to me of sustainability. So I went back to the triple bottom line. I was quickly corrected when they said it's all about sense of place. And so I offer you the thought that I think as we look towards sustainability, this stool that's been pretty solid is now going to look like a chair. And the question is, that fourth-legged stool could be inside an inner city. So, I'd like to talk about Seeds of Promise for a minute. It's a 501c3 organization that is focusing on an inner city area. We have these that can be seen in the city of Detroit. Most cities have them. We are focusing on about 2,000 people. What's interesting about the demographics, it's about 60 to 65% African American, it's about 30% Latino, Hispanic, and 5% all other ethnic diversities. So it doesn't look like a typical community that we all might be familiar with. On top of that, it has about a 35% poverty rate. So if you go inside this, the question is, is there a transformational model that you can address these issues, and how do you build it? So you build it by, first of all, establishing values. So we're trying to look at a value proposition with the local residents that they can build upon. It leverages resources. Their assets in there, their schools, their parks, their businesses, plus intellectual capital that, because of the sense of place, that these people who live there can bring forth. It's building trustful working relationships at the shareholder level. And who's the shareholder in this case? The resident. It's also building stakeholders, partnerships with others that want to deliver their services into this. Happen to be listening to a video that you all did just a little while ago about deep listening. And I have to tell you, it's amazing how quick we jump to reaction to say something. And I go back to Covey's principle, seek first to understand, then to be understood. That's hard for many of us. Because by perception, we want to quickly give you what we think needs to be done. That's not here. We listen to these local residents. We listen to children. We listen. It's a very unique way we get at it. But then once we understand, and after they've trusted us to give us what their needs and wants are, there's a co-creation of that service and a delivery mechanism that meets their needs. So deep listening, meeting expressed needs and wants, and then applying what works. This is a living and learning laboratory out there today. And it's most unique, and I'm going to give you the progress that we've made so far, but the uniqueness comes from the fact that we're trying to use what works. And then most important in all, it's about developing local empowered leadership at a resident level. So, the issues I offer that we've tried these in the past, but we've done them in a singular, maybe one-off position. We've looked at maybe literacy in the schools. But if you look at these quality of life issues, they're all connected. So this is the first time I've ever been part of anything that's as difficult as this, that's as chaotic as this, that's run by a, a wonderful group of volunteers today that tries to address this in a cohesive, interconnected fashion. What's unique about this is these outcome areas have to have a host neighbor with them. We will not do the work until they stand side by side and say, yes, that's important to us. So, educational attainment. We're working with the Dickinson Middle School. Take, now, I think we're in our third or fourth year, and they finally allowed the school to be open after hours. So, our work begins at three. 
That's a major, major step forward. Job creation, we work with Grand Rapids Plastics. We've now hired a number of people that come from a background that includes correctional institutions in the, and um, maybe spending some time in prison. We're changing the minds of the employers. Health, wellness, and nutrition. I can't thank the Kids Food Basket enough for starting the journey inside by delivering healthy food to these kids. Tens of thousands of meals now where they can leave at the end of school, not while they're there, but take a healthy meal back home to their family. Local health care delivery, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, our College of Nursing and others are trying to get in there to understand how we can deliver a local health care delivery system so the residents don't have to go out and visit other areas. Housing, Home Repair Services, West Michigan Environmental Action Council, Fifth Third Bank, um, Habitat are all working on how do we increase the level of home ownership and home improvement. Safe Neighborhoods, one of the first times we've worked side by side with all the local churches there because the churches provide the safe haven for these people. And then neighborhood revitalization and economic development, working with Link, working with the city of Grand Rapids to bring new revitalization there. So the question I leave you with is, what kind of progress are we making? Uh, this is a journey. It's been going on for several years, but the traction now is beginning to happen. And I just uh, offer you that are in this space that sometimes wonder whether you uh, um, can last that long. We have with the strength of others. <laughs> So what we've learned here is we now have 50 endorsing partners. When I say endorsing, they've actually signed a piece of paper that says, I will be accountable to this system. I'm going to report what I'm doing, and I'm going to give you my progress in an Opal Trusting working relationship. Not everyone has signed that. And as we all know, some play well in the sandbox and some don't. These people and these NGOs and these organizations are on the street, in the community, and they're ones that we don't have time to talk to today that have absolutely offered their strength and their best practices. We have over 15 of these what I call host neighbors. We're all familiar with block captains. Host neighbors have written their own job descriptions. Through a Kellogg grant that will end in a few years, they will now take control back of this of this uh, entire neighborhood on their own and make every one of those decisions. And so our goal, which is maybe a unique one, is to see how fast we can leave. We've created about 35 of these new jobs, and every time we get to a level, we get taken deeper and further in things like leasing and how do we get these uh, job opportunities outside of our area, so we're working uh, on that model. We've um, created this um, opportunity with the Grand Rapids Public Schools. We've opened up a um, SEEDS social enterprise business center now, and SEEDS now owns its first business. And the whole idea is to keep that capital right in that neighborhood and grow it. So I leave you with what I think are becoming the keys to this success. And first of all, it has to do with deep listening. And I've been in business for all my life and now the last uh, number of years here at Grand Valley and this deep, deep listening exercise is probably one of the most profound but yet so simple because these people actually do have a good education, a good background, they desire to be empowered, they want to contribute and I think we have issues of what we think a homeless person is, somebody who's been through a tough time. I, I only offer you to go listen and understand first before you seek some judgment like I needed to do. The next is this co-creation, the ability to work with these people to deliver what service they want when. For example, one of the things we found is with the kids, they wanted inner city scouting. Now, I came up and grew in urban scouting. They wanted a program designed specifically for the inner city, and now we have inner city scouting at the school. Resiliency and self-sufficiency. The whole goal of this is to create the capital that can be left there so that these neighborhoods don't have to be drawing off more programs from the outside in. Revitalization and reinvestment, that's where this value creation comes in. One example of that is if you take these jobs that have been created and put them at a minimum salary level, that creates hundreds of thousands of dollars of economic impact. And we've already gone through a million dollars of value creation uh, ourselves in this exercise. So this, you keep and draw back those dollars into the community. Why is that important is there's a study in Grand Rapids that shows over $100 million of business leakage where 
people that live inside the city have to go to 28th Street in the mall to get what they need and then bring it back in. So what does that tell you? We need to establish more local businesses. It is faith-directed. Uh, we have a number of churches that are working side-by-side side from a number of different denominations because the residents seek out those places of safety and want to see their engagement. And so we implement what works. We also empower local leadership and, cr and collective impact is our goal. And a little equation that I've learned about collective impact is short-term efficiencies plus long-term value equal collective impact. So we've been on a journey here I um, offer that to you is, and when you see one of these social entrepreneurs coming, spend some time with that person, understand what's on their heart's mind, and try to connect them to something where they can add some value. Thanks.